In this video demonstration, we're going to give an overview of nonlinear programming and show some examples of nonlinear programming problems and give a, a brief introduction into how those problems are solved. So, a nonlinear program is an optimization problem that can have a nonlinear objective function and nonlinear constraints, but it also can have a linear objective function and linear constraints mixed in there because linear is just really a subset of nonlinear. So if both the objective function and the constraints happen to be linear, then this problem reduces to what's called a linear program or an LP. So an NLP solver, a nonlinear programming solver in MATLAB, is a function called fmincon, and that name implies that you're trying to minimize some objective function, um, and the con refers to the constraints. fmincon can handle constrained optimization problems, which are typically much more difficult to solve than unconstrained problems. The basic formulation is looks like this. You have a nonlinear or, or linear objective function, f of x, where f is some generally nonlinear function of the inputs, which would be contained in a column vector called x, which would have which would be a column vector of scalar inputs. In this example we have two inputs, x1 and x2, but this could certainly be much longer than this. You could have dozens or hundreds of decision variables and x would then become dozens or hundreds of elements long. So like in the quadratic programming example that we've covered in a previous video lecture, um, we can have constraints on our inputs where they're bounded on the low side by a vector of lower bounds and on the high side by a vector of upper bounds. So each element in those vectors of lower bound and upper bound um, corresponds to the variable in our x matrix, in our x vector, excuse me. So we can also, as a general formulation, you can have linear equality constraints represented by the a sub eq times x equals b sub eq, and you can have uh, linear inequality constraints denoted there by a times x has to be less than or equal to b. So just like in the quadratic programming formulation, a nonlinear um, programming formulation can have those same types of constraints and they're entered in in basically the same way when you're using MATLAB solvers. The unique thing about the nonlinear programming solvers is their ability to handle nonlinear constraints. So they can be nonlinear inequality constraints where C is a function of X is less than or equal to zero. C is a vector valued function which means you can have multiple nonlinear inequality constraints and you would have to essentially you'll have to write a function that has multiple outputs but it, they must all in MATLAB at least they must all be contained in the same function which we'll get to toward the end of this video demo. You can also have nonlinear equality constraints so similarly um, this is a vector valued function where you can type in all of your nonlinear equality constraints and have a function output a whole column of of outputs but in general you have to formulate the problem so that you push all of your constraints all the algebraic terms in your constraints need to go on the right hand side of your equation so that its output should ultimately result in something that MATLAB can compute to be zero indicating that those constraints are satisfied. Nonlinear programming problems are iterative, which means you have to start at some initial guess points. You have to choose a vector with basically your, your guess at what you think the optimum might be. It doesn't necessarily have to even be close to the true optimum. It just solvers just need a starting point, and then they will iteratively go from that starting point following the gradient of your objective function and also following the constraints. It will, should lead you to your optimal point assuming that your problem is is well posed. So just as, as an example of a nonlinear programming problem. So if we had two decision variables x1 and x2 and we're trying to minimize this function so the sine of x1 plus 0 0.1 times x2 squared plus 0 0.05 times x1 squared that's a obviously a nonlinear function it no longer qualifies as a quadratic program because of that sine term in there so that makes it nonlinear. And on this particular problem we only have constraints on our input variables. So x1 must be, be between negative 5 and 1 and x2 must be between negative 3 and 3. 
So here's what that objective function looks like, and our input constraints are already represented on each of the axes in this problem. So as I mentioned, when you're solving a nonlinear programming problem, you need to have a starting point. So in this case, if our starting point is minus 3, minus 3, that's here. So that's our x, x naught. And in general, our solver is going to follow the gradient of this objective function, and it's going to do so something like this. And each, each of these arrows represents an iteration. So basically, in a crude way of speaking, that's basically how the solvers work, is they follow that gradient to try and get to the optimum. So in this case, the optimum is right there in the middle of that uh, oval shape, and the optimal point is x1 is equal to minus 1.4 and x2 is equal to 0. The value of our objective function in this case is negative 0 0.888. So that's, this would be an unconstrained, well I guess there are constraints on the input variables, but there are no additional constraints. And this is a nonlinear programming problem. So let's see how it looks when, once we introduce a constraint. So here we have the same optimization problem but we've introduced this new constraint that says x1 plus 3, that quantity cubed, minus x2 has to be equal to 0. So this is going to restrict our problem, whereas previously we had two degrees of freedom. We could move in this direction or in this direction entirely. Once we have our nonlinear equality constraint that essentially takes away one of our degrees of freedom and it's nonlinear, so now we'll be free to move in this direction one way or the other, but we can't really, we can't have a feasible solution outside of that range. So having this constraint consumes one of our degrees of freedom. So really, the one way to think about this is we don't have as much flexibility in our system to drive it to the optimal point. We have to, we're constrained by this line, and we've got to find an optimal solution on that line. So I'm using the same starting point. And one thing to note is this is no longer a feasible starting point. This is not a valid solution, but solvers can handle this. They can take an infeasible starting point and they can try to find where that may be feasible. So there's definitely a lot of detail and a lot of rigor programmed into how these solvers work. But basically it's still going to follow the gradients of the objective function, but it's also going to be drawn toward that constraint line. So just in a really crude manner of speaking, our solver would be doing something like this and driving first trying to get feasible but then trying to get the optimal solution. So we expect the optimal solution to be somewhere right there, somewhere on our line because this is an equality constraint and we expect it to find a point that results in this. So if we followed these um, surface contour lines we'd expect this to get to the minimum point. So we expect it to be right there and when I solve this problem numerically, we find that that is where the optimal solution is. So x1 is basically minus 2, and x2 is 1.01. .01. Our objective function is now minus 0 0.61. So one thing to note is that our objective function is worse in this case, and that's generally what you find when you go from a, an unconstrained problem to a constrained problem. The more constrained your problem gets, Generally, you can never do better by constraining a problem. The best you could do is to get the same solution, and in this case, we're not doing that good. We're getting a worse solution because we no longer have the flexibility and the freedom to go find this point. We have to go align with our constraint here. So if we took that same exact problem and turned our equality constraint now into an inequality constraint, this is basically saying that x2 has to be greater than or equal to that line. So basically we are, by making this an inequality constraint, we are ruling out this whole, this whole space. But our solver does have freedom. A solution here would be feasible. This is feasible. So anything above that line and to the left is going to be feasible. So there's still more freedom here, more degrees of freedom in this problem but you can see that this is going to be what's called an active constraint, meaning we're going to find a solution right about there still. And again, when we solve that problem, we find the exact same solution as in the equality constrained case.
So we could also flip this constraint and make it so that x2 has to be less than or equal to that quantity, which means now we're ruling out this space. So this is no longer feasible. And now this whole range remains feasible. And fortunately for us, this stationary point where the gradient of the objective function is zero stays in the feasible space. We're going to get a solution that is, is right there in the middle, just as we did in the unconstrained case. So we're going to get that better value of the objective function because this nonlinear inequality constraint is not active. So equality constraints are, by definition, always active. The point has to be on that line, whereas inequality constraints can be classified as inactive, as in this case that you're seeing here, or active, where our, um, our optimal point happens to be right on that con constraint line. One other issue to keep in mind with nonlinear programming problems is that they demonstrate something called non-convexity, or they can demonstrate something called non-convexity. And I'll show you in a simple case what that basically means. So if we take our same objective function and just expand the space that we're looking at on x1, so we're, s we're still looking at the same function, but now we're going to be looking at a bigger view of that function. and as you could imagine, this sine function is going to cause some oscillatory behavior in that function. So here's how it looks. This is our objective function. And now you can see in this particular window that we're looking at, we're actually seeing two minima, except these are now local minima, and they're not equal. This one is going to be lower in value than this one. So this is a non-convex problem. So one of the issues that arises in a non-convex problem is that you might not find the global minimum. If we were trying to minimize this function, we'd obviously want to eventually get to this point. But remember, we had to choose an initial starting point, And then the solver is going to be iteratively following the gradients to get to a point where the gradient is equal to 0. So if we started here, our solver is ultimately going to drive us to this local minimum, which might be good. It might, it's, a, it's definitely an improvement over our starting point, but you can see we're not getting to here because our solver doesn't know that, that there's an, a better point over there. So choosing that starting point can have a pretty big impact on the value. So if you're trying to maximize your profit, for example, you'd want to be you'd want to be here at this point rather than here because that mean, this one means you're making more money, whereas this might mean you're making more mon money relative to some other point, but this isn't a global optimum. So there is a lot of research and there are some solvers that work to overcome this, but computationally they just get really, really expensive. You could have multi-start solvers where you're taking, you're guessing a bunch of points just all over the place and all of those are trying to find the local minia, minima in their vicinity. So you might have some of these starting points ending up here, and you might have some of them ending up here, and then it's just a simple logic check to see which one is better, and it's obviously this one. But then those problems just tend to get computationally pretty expensive, especially when you're dealing with more than two variables. If you're up into the, the dozens or hundreds or even thousands of decision variables, you're really basically doing a lot of enumeration, trying to test out a lot of different combinations of inputs. So as I mentioned, the starting point can affect your final solution and which of these local minima your solver is finding. Another thing to keep in mind is that your constraints can also be non-convex. So if we were to draw a constraint line here, and let's just give it a kind of a crazy squiggle pattern, All right, if we're going to give this constraint kind of a crazy nonlinear pattern, you can see that your solver might think that this is an optimal point, or it might think that this is an optimal point, and that this is an optimal point, depending on which of those places it converges to first. So if you find a point here, this is actually not, this is obviously not as good of a solution as here. So non-convexity 
doesn't just apply to your objective function, but it also applies to your constraints. And it has one of the same effects that you're, you end up finding a local solution that might not be as good as the global solution. But generally, especially in this class, we'll, we'll look for a local solution and just assume that that's good enough because it is likely an improvement over whatever guess value we were going to implement before. One other thing to keep in mind is that the problem may have infeasibilities just in general. Your solver may not be able to even find a feasible point and that it's not unique to nonlinear programming problems. It's um, You could find that in linear programming or quadratic programming or really any kind of problems. And it may be user error where you've, you've over-specified your problem. You might have only three variables and ten equations. Well, it's impossible to satisfy ten equations with only three variables um, because the problem is over-specified. So that's an example of an infeasibility. You don't have enough degrees of freedom to even satisfy all the constraints. So there's a whole lot of theory behind nonlinear programming, and in fact, you could probably take multiple courses just on nonlinear programming. But that's kind of outside of the scope of this course where I'm trying to just give you an introduction to nonlinear programming and teach you how to use a solver. And you're getting probably 70 to 80 percent of the benefit just by knowing how to use a solver. Whereas specialists who are researchers in optimization will definitely want to get more detailed into how the solvers are working and what type of solver you to apply to what type of a problem. So if we wanted to formulate and solve this problem in MATLAB, we take our objective function that's been defined previously, our inputs with their constraints, and our nonlinear equality constraint. So this is one of the problems that I introduced previously. And this is, I'll give you just a brief overview of how you would enter this into MATLAB. So first of all, you need to program a separate function. So this would be a separate M file that just contained our objective function. So the output would just be the value of the objective function, and the inputs would be um, basically a vector x that contained x1 and x2 stacked on top of each other. So we've got to create a separate M file in the same folder that we're operating in that will be a representation of our objective function. We'll need to create vectors defining our lower bounds and our upper bounds, and those are pretty simple. In this particular problem, we have no linear inequality constraints, and we also have no linear equality constraints, but the MATLAB solver is going to ask us for those, so we need to just specify that there are none by setting all of these values equal to just empty brackets. And the other thing is we need to program a special function that represents all of our nonlinear constraints. These aren't quite as, quite as simple as matrix multiplication that you can use to represent linear constraints. You can't Because this is nonlinear, you can't use linear algebra to specify these things. So you have to explicitly create nonlinear functions to denote what your um, nonlinear constraints are. So I would take the this function, this constraint, and I would turn it into a function, and I just put this value CEQ on the left-hand side, but ultimately I want the solver to, to solve for the combination of X1 and X2 that result in CEQ being equal to zero, because that's the value that is going to satisfy this constraint. This particular problem didn't have inequality constraints, so we just have to specify that there are no inequality constraints, and we can just set C is equal to empty brackets. But we will need to create another M file to represent these nonlinear constraints. So I'm calling that M file non LCON or nonlinear constraints. So it's going to be a function of x, our, a vector containing our input variables. And the MATLAB synta syntax asks us to define both our um, inequality constraints and our equality constraints as a part of the same function and in this order. So the output in this function for C is just going to be the empty brackets, and then for CEQ it's just going to be this simple equation. And if we had multiple constraints, well then C and CEQ would be vector valued functions, so the, our function in MATLAB would expect us to define a column vector with the exact number of constraints, and each, one of, each element in that column vector would correspond to a different nonlinear constraint equation. This will probably become 
much more clear in the next video demonstration where I'm going to actually walk you through my code that I used to solve these problems. So stay tuned for that one. We're going to demonstrate how to formulate and solve this exact problem in MATLAB.